Hello, everyone. First, thank you all first to come into our presentation. So my name is Xie Qing. And I am Michael. So we are software engineers from Google Open Source Security team with the goal of making open source secure at scale. So we work on a group of projects labeled OSV, or open source vulnerabilities, which helps open source developers manage and fix non-vulnerabilities in their dependencies. So OSV includes open SSF OSV schema, a format for projects to publish their vulnerability advisories, so that's easy for others to consume. We also run osv.dev, which is a database that aggregates all the OSV format advisories that's been published by the community. We currently have over 237,000 vulnerabilities from 28 ecosystems, coming from multiple security advisory sources, including GitHub Security Advisory Database. There is also OSV Scanner, which uses the data from osv.dev to scan your project dependencies for vulnerabilities. Now, you may have an idea what OSV does. Today, we are going to focus the steps after vulnerability is found, which is remediation. Why this can be hard? Our solution for this, as well as our lessons learned. So first, let's take a look at a real example. So here is the list of vulnerabilities reported by OSV scanner when scanning a Maven POMIX mail file. You can see there are a bunch of vulnerabilities reported, in total 46. Considering the number of vulnerabilities reported, now you may have a question, which vulnerability should I fix first? One strategy here is probably to start from the most critical ones. So let's take a look at the severity scores of these vulnerabilities. We can see that in this list, there are two critical vulnerabilities that we highlighted here, and 17 vulnerabilities with high severity. The two critical vulnerabilities have the same CVSS score, and let's try to fix them. So to fix a vulnerability, we usually need to figure out what is the dependency that brings in this advisory and whether it's like direct or indirect. So we go back to take a look at the manifest file, which is the poor mix file. We put a screenshot with part of the information, and we found out that there are in total 295 dependencies 22 of all these dependencies are vulnerable, and four of these vulnerable dependencies are direct, which are highlighted in the yellow box here. So the direct dependencies are also highlighted here in the vulnerability scanning result. Uh, one of the critical vulnerabilities is brought by the direct dependency called ShiroWeb, and the good news is that we should probably be able to fix this critical vulnerability by bumping the version of direct dependency. And the next step is to figure out what is the version that we should bump to. Then we go to svdev to have a look of the vulnerability. And we can see that the fixed version of this vulnerability is 1.12.0. So we kind of write down bump Shiro Web to 1.12.0 to remove the vulnerability. So far, the whole process is still smooth. Then we try to fix the other critical vulnerability, which is brought by a transitive dependency called Jackson Mapper ASL. To fix a transitive dependency, we need to first figure out which direct dependency depends on it. So we need to take a look at dependency graph resolved by Maven. Here is a screenshot of part of dependency graph generated by Maven. After tracing the transitive dependency, we find that Zeppelin's engine is the direct dependency that depends on Jackson Mapper ASL transitively. Then here it comes the most tricky question. Which version should we bump this direct dependency to to get rid of the, the, the vulnerability? Then we go to Maven Central to see what are the newer versions available and whether they have vulnerability. We depend on version 0.11.1 of Zephyr's engine, and there's only one newer version, 0.11.2, available. And one thing to note here, that Maven Central only indicates the directive vulnerability on this package version, but not the transitive ones. So we need to find another source to get information about transitive vulnerabilities. Then we go to Open Source Insights, which is also a Google project providing insights on open source software to check version 0.11.2 of Safeline's engine and realize actually this version is also vulnerable transitively. 
This means that there isn't a version not vulnerable for upgrading, and thus we are not able to remediate the transitive critical vulnerability. So far, we only fixed one vulnerability, and there are another 40 plus to go. So for each of these 40 plus remaining vulnerabilities, we need to kind of repeat actions that we just took and imagine how much time you would spend on this. Also, during the remediation process, we kind of switch between different services, including osv.dev for vulnerability information, and the dependency graph generated by Maven, and also available versions of our package from Maven Central. And in addition, we kind of waste some time on remediating on the non-fixable vulnerability. So if we know this information earlier, we can save the time acting on the ones that are more actionable. So now you can imagine that how helpful it will be if we have a tool kind of provide insights on the vulnerability fixes as, as well as the detailed remediation steps. Still taking this Maven Pomix model as an example, so our solution is able to tell you that 39 out of the vulnerabilities can be fixed by updating 20 dependencies. With this sort of insights, people no longer need to spend great amount of time fixing these vulnerabilities one by one. People can also save the time skipping those vulnerabilities that are not fixable. Moreover, people do not, to, do not need to switch between different services. All you need to do is just to run OSV scanner. So all the information that we provided is from a feature called guide remediation in OSV scanner. So guide remediation, also known as OSV scanner fix, aims to help developers to fix the high number of non-vulnerabilities and dependencies reported by re vulnerability scanners by providing small number of actionable steps. And this is why we call this guided. Here is a screenshot of the interactive interface of guide remediation. So currently, guide remediation supports npm package JSON file, package log JSON file, as well as Maven PomXML file. So guide remediation involves dependency graph resolution to determine the minimum changes required. So you no longer need to trial which newer versions of a direct dependency fix the vulnerable transitive dependency. Guide remediation can prioritize direct dependency upgrades by total number of transitive vulnerabilities fixed. For example, in the screenshot here, the number of vulnerabilities can be fixed, as well as potential known vulnerabilities introduced are listed for each dependency upgrade. And vulnerabilities can also be prioritized by their severity score or by dependency depths and dependency type. For example, whether you want to exclude dependency development dependencies for upgrades. And to automate the whole process, any modifications are written back to the manifest and log files directly. And besides the interactive mode, guide remediation can also be run as a command line tool, which means it's easier for you to integrate your existing workflows. And to further automate the whole process, there are also scripts available to automatically apply and test remediation patches. So here are the results of running guide remediation against the example Maven Pomix spell we just discussed. We can see that 39 out of 46 vulnerabilities are fixed by updating 20 dependencies. We are able to write the modifications back to the root Pomix spell file to reflect the fixes, and properties are updated and new dependency management requirements are added. In addition, we are also able to trace back the requirements in local parent point XML if needed. And in the screenshot, we can see that properties defining requirements for Shiro Web, which is the direct dependency that we just discussed, that brings the critical vulnerability is updated. And after introducing guide remediation, this amazing feature, let's take a look how we kind of solve this problem. First, there are manifest and log files in a project repository. So a manifest file is, is a file that lists all the direct dependency that's required for your project. And the log file records the exact versions of both direct and the indirect dependency that were installed. So to get dependency information, we ask the re reader to retrieve the requirements from the manifest file. Then the resolver is invoked to compute dependency graph based on the requirements. For dependency resolution, we leverage depths or dev services and libraries. 
So Dev also known as Open Source Insights, is also a service developed and hosted by Google to help developers better understand the structure, construction, and security of open source software. The service examines each package, constructs a full detailed graph of its dependencies, and makes the results available to anyone who could benefit from them. Here is a screenshot of Depsol Dev website, and there is also API and BigQuery data available, so feel free to visit their website for more information. Depsol Dev also open source their dependency resolution library, which is written in Golang, and to perform dependency resolution, we also fetch package metadata from Depsol Dev API. So we just talked about how to get dependencies graph based on a manifest file. For a look file, since the exact version of each dependency is recorded, we are able to read the graph directly. So far, this is the first step to extract the dependencies from project files. Next, let's talk a, take a look at like, what's special for Maven and, and NPM in this step. So Maven port mix file. Maven port mix file is used to define dependencies for Java projects. So Maven doesn't have a, like, a standard look file format, so transitive dependencies are not recorded, and thus we need the help from Resolver to find actual dependencies. And even for direct dependencies declared in Mopomix file, it's not that easy to get their requirements. So first, requirement versions can be defined and replaced by properties, which require us to perform variable substitution when preparing the home XML file. Second, versions can also be defined in the dependency management section instead of the standard dependency section. Dependency management plays an important role when remediating transitive vulnerabilities, since they control the versions of artifacts used in transitive dependencies, as we showed here from Maven documentation. And dependency management may be from other files with a special type of input dependency, and dependency requirements can also be inherited from other files, which are defined in parent section. A parent may be accessible locally if you specify the relative path, or it may be placed on a remote repository. And there are also dependencies defined in build profiles. Each build profile is like a mini project. All the things that we mentioned, like dependencies, dependency management, properties, and et cetera, all that can be defined in a profile. And whether to consider profile or not depends on whether this profile is activated. There are also concepts of software requirements and hard requirements for Maven's version requirement specification. So software requirement is a simple version, which means that this version will be selected if no other version appears earlier in the dependency graph. Hard requirement is a version range, indicates the range of acceptable versions. There is also hard requirement on a single version, which means only this version is allowed in this dependency graph. So here are all the complexities when we extract dependency information from maven.xml file. Next, Michael will tell us what's special for NPM as well as remaining steps in guide remediation. Thank you. Um, for JavaScript projects that use NPM, we have our package.json manifest file, which lists out the key value pairs of our dependencies and the versions of them that we require. But there's a few different kinds of dependencies in the file. So in addition to the regular dependencies with there's dev, optional, and peer dependencies that we need to keep track of, because each of them are treated slightly differently. For the requirement versions, they are usually semver ranges, but a version could also use a string tag, for example, latest. And the actual version these refer to can and will usually change over time. And then there's these alias versions, which is basically depend on this package, but name it something else. So more things we have to keep track of. But when NPM does resolve these dependencies, it resolves it to a graph and downloads all the dependencies, direct and indirect, into the node modules folder and generates the package lock.json lock file to list all the different packages that ended up being installed and where. To handle version conflicts, instead of backtracking in resolution, NPM will install the same package multiple times at different versions, or even include the same version installed in multiple locations. So you see here in this example, uh, Foo is installed multiple times, once at version 1.2.3, and twice at version 
Uh, when we are passing the file, we also have to keep track of these multiple copies of the packages separately. And npm actually has two different formats to represent the package lock.json file, depending on which version of npm you're using. So there's this old format, which is a version, uh, lock file version one, and this new version, which is lock file version three, and lock file version two, which is npm's version seven and eight, actually has both of these structures within it. And one thing to note is that the lock file itself in these uh, formats describes the paths of the installed packages, which is not the same as the dependency graph. So after we've passed the dependencies out of the files, we also have to reconstruct the graph ourselves. So for example, the lock file might define the node module structure you see on the left here, when the actual dependency graph is actually what's on the right. Um, if we're getting the dependency graph out of the manifests alone, we can use the devs.dev resolvers to generate them. But that covers the complexities involved in getting our dependency graphs out of our files. Now we can actually start looking at the vulnerabilities themselves. And thankfully, this is pretty straightforward with the OSV API. We can just query it with our packages and the versions and get back all of the OSV records that affect us in a machine readable format. The OSV records include useful information such as the affected version ranges, CVSS scores, and like a human readable description of the vulnerability. With these vulnerabilities and the dependency graph, we can find the, all the paths to the vulnerabilities in our project when it comes time to remediate. But this kind of brings up a small question as to what actually counts as a vulnerability in a graph. So for example, in NPM, we can have the same package installed multiple times, each with the, the same vulnerability. So here we have package A version one installed as a direct dependency and version two installed both under B and C separately. And say both versions of A are affected by the same vulnerability. How many vulnerabilities do you consider to be in this graph? You could say there's one unique vulnerability here that happens to affect all three, all three versions or instances. You could say that A version one is vulnerable and A version two is vulnerable, giving us two vulnerabilities. Or you could say that we have three installed instances of this vulnerability, so we have three vulnerabilities. And it sounds like a bit of a semantic difference, but it gets a bit complicated when you're actually trying to remediate these. So if you take these three example proposed changes, the first one on the left, we've changed only the direct dependency on A to use a non-vulnerable version which has removed the vulnerable path through our direct dependencies, but we're still deemed vulnerable to it by B and C. But despite that, this is probably a change we would want to make if we could. The second one, we, instead of bumping our direct dependency on A, we've bumped B and C, which now instead of direct, depending on A directly, they both depend on A through another package D, which now has its own copy of A that they can share. Uh, this has reduced the number of installed vulnerabilities by one, and the path to the vulnerability has changed, but it's not clear if this is actually a remediation of the vulnerability. And in this third candidate, we've changed our direct dependency on A to use the still vulnerable version two, which uh, because of this, B and C no longer need to install their own copies of the vulnerability, and now it can depend directly on the same direct dependency that we have, which has reduced the number of counted vulnerable versions and vulnerable installs, but has not actually removed any of the vulnerability paths in our graph. Um, this isn't strictly an NPM problem either. The similar situation can happen, for example, when one vulnerability affects multiple different packages. And it's not really a big deal, but it's an interesting problem that we've come across that we wouldn't normally have thought about. But that digression aside, we now know which vulnerabilities are in our project, which means we can actually start trying to remediate them. But this remediation box actually does involve changing our requirements, which kind of connects this back up here. <laughs> um, and because of the requirements change, we have to look downstream what has changed in our graph and our vulnerabilities. And so realistically, this whole section is actually part of remediation. But it's easier to think of it as its own box that spits out patches for our files. So we've been coming out up with a few different strategies to try remediate vulnerabilities in our dependencies based roughly on what a human person might try to do when attempting to remediate vulnerabilities themselves. We have three at the moment, which happens to be one per file format we support, but none of them are actually tied to each format specifically. Our first most basic strategy is we call in place. Uh, this is remediation for lock files. So right now package lock.json only. Basically, for a vulnerable package, we see if we can find a non-vulnerable version that we can replace it with that still satisfies all the constraints imposed on it by the graph. So in this example, we can replace package version 1.0.2 with version 1.2.3, 1 
because it satisfies both the major version 1 and the less than 1.3.0 requirement on it, and its dependency on this debt package is still satisfied by the version that's already there, despite the version specification itself changing. Um, here's what it looks like on an example NPM project. We have, uh, we can see in this example there were 202 vulnerabilities detected, and this in-place strategy can fix about a quarter of them, which is about 57. And since some of the packages are affected by multiple vulnerabilities, this is all done by updating versions of just 36 packages, and you can see some of the changes here on the right. So there are some pros and cons of this approach. First of all, it doesn't require full dependency resolution, we just need to be able to match the constraints on the graph. The patches themselves are unlikely to break anything in the graph, assuming the version requirement ranges described by uh, packages themselves is valid and correct and it does minimal changes to the dependency graph itself. Large changes could have a potential to impact your project. It's something to be aware of. Um, on the other hand, there's a limited ability for this to actually remediate the vulnerabilities since there's a lot of constraints on the packages themselves when we're looking at them like this. And patches themselves can possibly be undone if you ended up recreating your lock file in some way. So if it gets rewritten because you've updated a package, the vulnerability may end up being reintroduced. Um, that in-place strategy only works on lock files, so you have to do something slightly different if we wanted to work on Maven, since that only has the manifest file, which is why we have our second strategy we've called override, which is, supports the pom.xml manifest. So like in-place, we try to replace a vulnerable package with a non-vulnerable version, but this time we override the version specification to directly choose which version we want. In Maven, we use the dependency management section to do this, but similar could be done if we use the npm override section in the package.json file. So in this example, version 1.0.2 of this package was chosen by resolution and is vulnerable. And remember, these are Maven's soft requirements, so that 3.2.1 was ignored because it came later in resolution. Um, we can use the dependency management section to set the version of this package to the later and non-vulnerable version 2.0.4, which now takes precedence over these requirements. And of course, if we upgrade the version of one package, it will have some downstream effects on its own dependencies. So with our original Maven example from the beginning, we see that 39 out of the 46 vulnerabilities that we scanned can be fixed using this strategy. And below there, there's a list of the versions we're overriding. Below that, the IDs that it's fixing. And at the very bottom, we see that there's seven remaining volumes that cannot be fixed, which means that there's no fixed version of the package available. What this practically looks like is writing to a bunch of different places in our POM files. So on the left, we're changing a number of properties defined in our parent POM that are used to set the versions of some of our dependencies. And on the right, there's some more POM, uh, there's some more, there are some more project properties in our main project POM files that we're also updating. But we also need to update the versions of some indirect dependencies. So we've created this new dependency management section at the bottom to set those versions. Um, pros and cons of this approach is that as long as there's a fixed package version of the vulnerability, we can remediate it with this strategy. And the remediated vulnerabilities won't be introduced later since the overrides will remain in the manifest file. And it's relatively cheap as an algorithm. It doesn't require too much extra computation beyond the initial resolution of the dependency graph. But not all ecosystems support this overriding behavior, and overriding has a potential to break builds of your project. It's less of a problem in Maven due to the nature of the soft requirements, but still something you have to be aware of. And there's also a possibility of a lot of noise in your manifest files. There's a lot of overrides that can be written, and we may eventually not need them any longer, but we don't know when we can remove them. But this brings us to our more, most complex algorithm, which we called RELAX. Uh, this is for manifest files only and currently only supported on the npm package.json file. Um, in words, it, we relax the versions of our direct dependencies to resolve vulnerabilities in our transitive dependencies, which comes down to like four steps. One, we re-resolve the dependency graph, which on its own can fix many vulnerabilities in the lock file that were there already. But if that doesn't work, walk the graph from the vulnerable dependency up to the direct dependency that brings it in, bump the version of the direct dependency, and then re repeat these steps until the vulnerability is gone or we can't do any more version bumping. So to give an example, so we have this dependency graph with direct dependencies on A, B, and C, and this vulnerable package V at version one. We can follow the requirements edges from the package V to determine which of the direct dependencies are bringing this in. And note 
when we're walking the graph, only this right edge of V is actually constraining it to the vulnerable version one. The left edge is a wildcard dependency, which we can actually skip when walking, which, because it might not actually be constraining it to a vulnerable version. So when we do walk up, we find that only B and C are actually causing this vulnerability. So we can try bumping the versions of B and C to version two and then re-resolving the graph. And when we do that, we see that the graph is changed slightly, but the vulnerability still exists. So we can walk the edges again and find this time only C is causing the vulnerability. And so we can bump C to version three. And after we do that and re-resolve, we see that C no longer depends on V at all, and V is no longer constrained to version one. So version three, which say is invulnerable, is used instead. And so we've remediated the vulnerability in V by bumping B to version two and C to version three. Running this on the example NPM project from a bit earlier, we see that first, without doing anything else, re-resolving the graph on its own actually brings us down to 78 vulnerabilities from the 202 in the lock file. And we've, we've discovered that 46 of these have no fixable paths at all, so we don't need to look at them. But for the remaining, we see there are a few options on what direct dependency updates we can make to try fix them. Taking a deeper look at one of them, we see that we can fix nine vulnerabilities by bumping two direct dependencies, in this case, Connect Mongo and Mongoose. And looking at one of these vulnerabilities, we see that the transitive dependency on base on here, on the right, uh, was being brought in by both packages. So we've determined that we need to bump both of them to remove this vulnerability from our graph. So there are pros and cons of this, of course. Um, first of all, this can completely remove a vulnerable package from the graph. So we don't actually need to rely on a fixed version of a vulnerable package existing to remediate it. Um, this, can, this also only directly modifies your direct dependencies, which are the things you have the most control of in your project. But for cons, it is relatively expensive as an algorithm because we do end up having to re-resolve potentially multiple times to try and find a solution that will remove the vulnerability. And also this can cause large changes in your resolve dependency graph, which may, not, may or may not actually be a problem, but it's something you have to consider. But one way over another, we've determined the number of dependency patches we can do to try to remediate uh, vulnerabilities in our project. But there can still be a lot of them, and trying to apply them all at once might not work out too well. So we've got to have some way of prioritizing what we can want to try first, and whatever patches we do choose, we do need to apply them back to our files. So the first part of prioritization is actually knowing what vulnerabilities we care about. There are over 200 vulnerabilities in this project lock file. We can't focus on all of them at once. So we've added a few ways to cut down on this list by filtering out the vulnerabilities you might deem unimportant. So first of all, if you know any specific vulnerabilities you do or do not want to look at, you can filter them directly by their IDs. But we do provide some metrics to filter by. So if you only care about vulnerabilities affecting production and not in your development or test dependencies, you can remove them. You want to ignore vulnerabilities below a certain CVSS score. In this case, we're ignoring vulns below a six. Um, if you want to exclude vulnerabilities in transitive dependencies that are too deeply indirect, since they're less likely to be exploitable, you can do that. So for example, we are excluding anything here that's only reachable through five layers of transitive dependencies or more. So with these filters, we've gotten rid of over half of the vulnerabilities that don't matter to us now, down to 90. But there are still a lot of things there to consider. Um, even after applying all those filters and trying the relaxed strategy, we still have a number of potential patches to choose from. Um, generally, when we're actually choosing which patches we want to do, we want to try to get the best bang for your buck when making changes. So we want to fix the most vulnerabilities with the least number of changes. So for example, if we're going to change just one package, we might as well try changing the one that fixes 10 vulnerabilities instead of the one that fixes just one. And even though these two patches both fix six vulnerabilities, one of them upgrades one package, which is easier than the other one, which upgrades two. But there are still some other things we might want to consider when we're choosing patches. Larger jumps in the assembler version of the package may be more likely to break something in our project. So we might want to look at whether a change is in the major, minor, or patch version of a dependency. And also, some changes can introduce new vulnerabilities. So there are some trade-offs you have to make when patch with some patches that we have to take into account. But um, that basically covers most of the steps involved in our end-to-end -end guided remediation. But there are still some there's still some amount of developer interaction needed in this whole process. So we've been looking in ways we can try automate this. And so 
we've developed a little bit of a proof of concept script for automated remediation in NPM using the non-interactive mode of the tool. Basically, we can leverage a project's tests to determine which packages can be upgraded safely without requiring code rewrites. So in a loop, basically, we run the remediation, apply the best patches, then run the tests. And if the tests fail, we know we can't upgrade those specific packages without any more um, code changes. So we simply block the upgrades to those patches for now and retry. So in this example, upgrading the mongoose and marked packages causes our tests to fail. So we block them from the automated remediation. And in the end, we end up with a number of packages that can safely be upgraded to fix vulnerabilities. Here, we can automatically remediate the vulnerabilities in these four packages. Um, if you're interested, you can find this script in the OSV scanner repo at the bottom there. Um, also, if anything else in this talk is interested to you, um, you can look at the rest of our stuff. You can find the documentation for guided remediation at that link at the top. And you can also install OSV scanner and the, use the guided remediation feature with those commands in Go. Um, OSV scanner is also available on a number of package managers, so you might be able to install it from there. Um, you could take a look at the OSV scanner repo on GitHub if you wanted to look at the code or try it out yourself, or have a look at the osv.dev website, which should have links to everything else from there if you just want one thing to remember. But yeah, that's everything from me right now. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I think we have some time for some questions, if there are any. Um, there's one down here. Oh, th thank you, presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, with uh, vulnerability remediation strategy. Uh, can can uh, edit edit file such as package lock JSON and package JSON uh, be um, ba back to previous uh, previous file? So uh, I think uh, we need uh, we have we have to store previous file uh, when run at nanaki no. Uh, you, you la, la, your strategy algorithm. Um, so we're currently assuming that these are being run on like a Git repository. So when we do try a change and we see it doesn't work, we can use like Git reset to kind of revert it back if we need to. Um, ah, ah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, there's probably some improvements to be made to be able to roll back them without having to do it with through Git, but it's still like a work in progress, I guess. Oh, a question down there. <laughs> Hi, so uh, great talk. Um, a, a lot of package managers use SAT solvers and things like this that can give non-deterministic sets of dependencies in that like two users given the same input might end up actually choosing different packages for reasons you know, unrelated to a lot of this. Um, I noticed that you're doing some effectively pinning of this, but uh, do these techniques also hold up in that sort of scenario? Yeah, it is quite a difficult thing to, for us to deal with. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, NPM and Maven are deterministic as long as the packages don't change, the, the available packages don't change. Um, I believe um, NPR PyPy, which uses like a SAT server, is also deterministic because it, it has a fixed order in which it tries things. Not many things have randomness in their dependency things. So we haven't really looked into like how we can alleviate this non-determinism at the moment, but it is something we will need to look at if we are expanding to an ecosystem like that. Um, okay, since no one else has their hand up, I have another question here. So do you look at all at what code paths are touched? Uh, because a, a lot of times vulnerabilities are actually in code that is unreachable. Yeah, it's something we want to start looking at. Um, right now we don't have the 
data for npm, for example, to actually work out uh, the called functions, function in like function call analysis. Um, we do want to look at like import reachability in Maven soon-ish, but it, it is uh, something on our roadmap at the moment. I, I think we have an issue kind of opened on our OSV scanner repository, so feel free to track that issue for future updates. Yeah, we tried to provide some like some method of doing this through like the depth um, dependency depth um, choices you can make, but it's not automated at the moment. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have one question. And can uh, OSV scanner use can can OSV scanner be used for um, the OS package managers or other? Uh, you introduced only two, uh, Maven, Maven and uh, NPM. So any other? Um, can I use it for uh, any other package managers? Yeah. So for the scan portion, for the scanning part, not the remediation part. OSV Scanner supports a lot of um, package managers. It supports PyPy, uh, Cargo, uh, NPM, Maven, uh, some other things I might be forgetting right now. Uh, it's all on the website there if you want to look. Uh, but like okay. um, guided remediation, currently we've only supported Maven and NPM because there's quite a lot of dependency resolution work we have to get to support it. OK, thanks. Uh, I think like Python is probably the next ecosystem which is on our roadmap. And also, if you have like particular idea about what you like ecosystem you feel like will be interesting, feel free to open any issue on our repository. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the presentation. So my question is about how percentage or how many of the packages in like NPM ecosystem can be fixed by this method. Have you done some empirical study on that? I think the result will be interesting. Uh, we don't have any formal. I can't really give any numbers really. And so, um, we haven't. We've looked at like we've kind of looked at it how well it performs, and we've found that it does find a lot of them. Uh, but I can't give you any specific numbers at this point. Okay. Um, thank you. Hi, thank you for your great uh, great talk. Uh, have you tried to, or do you have any um, like proof of concept or something to um, integrate this into GitHub Actions or to automate in some manner? I mean, maybe Microsoft or something like that. Yeah, we've been looking at um, ways to, you know, automate this into like tools. Um, we have an open communication channel with um, depend the Dependabot team who are interested in this for Maven, but we haven't done anything specific for that. Um, we have the automated mode script that we've kind of done as like a sample of stuff, but yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much. All right. I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Uh, feel free to kind of open issues or like comment on open source projects that we have. Thank you. Thank you.